Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The format of this meeting is two 10-minute speakers, followed by our information break, and then our main speaker who will speak for 10 minutes, or 30 minutes, rather. Our first 10-minute speaker is Mark. Hi, everyone. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My name is Mark. And I'm grateful for those who came before me, so there's a solution today. Um, I want to thank Chris for asking me to speak. Uh, my, my sobriety day is May 17th, 2004. My sponsor is Mark W. Spring Lake, New Jersey. Thanks for coming up, Mark. I really appreciate it. Um, my home group is the Atlantic Group, Tuesday night. Um, and I'm currently making my ninth step amends and growing in steps 10, 11, and 12. And you know, life is pretty good today. And uh, I didn't feel that way when I showed up here in May 2004. You know, as, as far as I was concerned, it, it was over. You know, it was like <laughs> it was like a bad after-school special, and uh, I couldn't figure out how I ended up here. You know, I was I was supposed to overcome this. You know, I was supposed to be able to to grow out of this, but it didn't work that way for me. Um, I don't remember. When I took my first drink, uh, I kind of grew up all, I grew up in a European family. I grew up all over the world and, uh, alcohol was such like a part of the social fabric of my life that I don't remember when I had my first drink. You know, I know I was drinking before the age of 10. It was just, you know, we got served booze at the table. It was just, just normal. You know, I guess, I guess the notion was that, you know, if you start, start them young, they might learn how to drink responsibly. It didn't work out that way for me. Um, but even before I picked up that first drink, I had the feelings of being restless, irritable, and discontent. Uh, I remember, you know, we used to go to all these places, and, and back 10, 15, 20 years ago, they would always have these travel brochures for places. And, and I looked at the pictures, and I asked my mom when I was five years old, I said, Mom, how come it's always nicer in the picture than when you get there? And that, that was my, that was how I looked at life. That was how I experienced life. You know, I was always disappointed. Um, nothing was ever enough, no matter, you know, Anything I looked for from outside to put inside me or, you know, any type of experience, it just, it, you know, it lost that luster short after, you know, I consumed it or I did it. And, and so when I, when that continued and that progressed, so even before I picked up my first drink, you know, I, I had, I had those feelings. Um, you know, I started, I didn't, I started drinking consistently at age 13 and 14 and, you know, I was never really comfortable with who I was in social situations. You know, I was fascinated by women, but I was just, like, intimidated by them. Uh, I wasn't good in large crowds, but booze changed all that, you know. I used to refer to, to alcohol as liquid confidence because that's what it was for me, you know. I, I could drink, and, and I just became somebody else. All my cares disappeared, and, and I wasn't worried about anything. And You know, I had a lot of fun. I really did. And, um, you know, growing up, my heroes were people like Jim Carroll and Brett Easton Ellis and Jay McInerney and Jack Kerouac and, uh, um, you know, and Ken Kesey and Neil Cassidy. And, I, and my whole, like, you know, I decided at 16 that, you know, this is how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Every moment I wanted to be drunk. You know, that was, that was just it. And it was, it was a, it, you know, it seemed like the most logical decision at that time because everything was better when I was drinking. And, uh, you know, and I didn't really have a lot of consequences along the way. And, uh, you know, I remember in, in high school, I took this creative writing course and I used to write about, you know, my escapades and, uh, missions in the Lower East Side and Spanish Harlem. And, you know, I, I think my teacher had no idea that any of those stories were true, but, but it, was, it was the only ever, it was the only A I ever got in high school. But, um, you know, there weren't a lot of consequences and, and things were fun, you know, um, but, uh, you know, it was really unmanageable and I was always trying to manage you know, how I was feeling through booze, and then, you know, I was always trying to manage my alcohol consumption just because, like, I always ended up taking too much, and uh, just could never hold on to that desired effect. You know, there was a brief period of time where, you know, about a five-year period where those feelings that I had when I was young, that I was always in the wrong place, that there was somewhere else I was supposed to be, booze corrected that. You know, booze was my solution, and it worked. And then, you know, over time, it, that, that started to change. By 19, uh, you know, I was 18, I was a daily drinker. By 19, I was drinking in the morning. And that's basically how my last 10 years was. Uh, I couldn't get from my bed to the shower without 
drinking. I just could I couldn't deal with you know who I was, what was going on, and um, you know no matter no matter what, when I opened up my eyes, like that that resolve of like I can't let this happen again, that faded within five minutes. You know, and I found myself doing the exact same thing. You know, trying to stuff you know all the feelings down in, in every everything that was going on with me that I just could not, you know, I just couldn't handle being me. Um, and for the last five years, I mean, you know, I, I don't know, I've been around here long enough to know my story's not that unique. Um, the last five years was just, uh, you know, it, it just got to be pro- progressively worse and worse. And, um, you know, it got to a point, I, I don't know what happened, other than say, like, God intervened in my life. I didn't see it at that time. But, I, you know, I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because, you know, everything I tried had worked, and or hadn't worked, sorry. And, uh, you know, it was over. I was just, I was done. I was done. And I went to, you know, it was that moment I was outside the 5.30 meeting in Summit, New Jersey, and, and I was just like, I was late, and I didn't want to go in. And, you know, when I went in that night, I was scared, you know, as, as we should be, you know, when we come here. Um, and I, but somehow, intuitively, I just knew that I was home, like, Again, I had that feeling that I was in the right place. I wasn't so thr- I wasn't thrilled about being here, <laughs> but I knew I had to be here, and I was okay with that. And uh, I was so scared. I went to another meeting that night, and they gave me a big book. And uh, I went home that night, and I didn't know what to do, so I started reading it. And I got through about 50 pages that first night, and I was just so afraid. I got down on my knees, and I didn't believe in God, but I got down on my knees, and I asked God for help. And I just said, I didn't ask God to say, I didn't say, God, stop me from drinking, stop me from using, just stop all that. I just said, just make, just please let me wake up tomorrow. And just for once, just let me have a feeling that I don't have to use today. And I woke up the next day, and, and that was the case. And I'm really lucky to say that, you know, I haven't had the desire to, to drink or use since that time. Um, now, of course... I, f- I forgot about that <laughs> over a six month period. You know, my ego started to come back as things got better. Um, you know, but what I found is, you know, someone told me early on, you know, there are two types of people in this meeting, they, uh, in this uh, fellowship people who go, uh, don't drink and go to meetings or people who do the work. You know, and if you want the results and you want the promises to come true in your life, you know, you have to do the work. Um, so I was really, you know, at that point I started going through the steps. But, um, you know, I was also taught it was, ta- it was important to talk about how I developed a relationship with God because, you know, when I first came in here, I kind of felt cheated when I looked up on the board or when I looked up on the sheets and I saw that. And it wasn't until I was reading the agnostics, I'm just going to read a short part of this, that I, you know, it's really started to develop a relationship with God. Um, actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by pl- calamity, by pomp, by worship or other things, but in some form or other, it is there. For faith and a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search closely, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down, deep down within us. In our last analysis, it is only there he may be found. It is so with us. We can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. And when I read that, I, I had read that before, but when I read that that one time, it just it hit me, you know. And, and at that point, I you know I, I made the decision that I was really just going to surrender to this process and go through the steps as they're outlined in the big book. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really made all the difference. I think I rely more on this program now than I ever did before because, you know, I still, my, my thinking is, is out of whack, you know, and I, and I need, I need help with that. You know, so I go to God, I, I refer to this book, I talk to my sponsor and, and people who've walked this path. Um, how much time? Another minute. Um, you know, a few minutes, all the new people, you're going to get an opportunity to introduce yourselves and let us know who you are and where you're at. And, uh, and I just want to encourage you to take that opportunity. Um, everyone's been there. <laughs> you know, I didn't really enjoy it when I was, but, um, you know, take advantage of the fact that people here want to help you. You know, and uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And, um, you know, probably the best thing you can do is just go sign up as a member here, get a sponsor here, and go through the big book. And, uh, I don't know, ask.
I just want to say thanks for my sobriety, and I'll see you on campus. <laughs> Our second 10-minute speaker is Layla. Thank you, Sean. Hi, I'm Layla. I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to thank the Atlanta group for this opportunity to be of service and for giving me my life back and welcoming me into the first family I've really felt a part of. Um... I have wonderful sober sisters here. I have a wonderful sponsor, Patty S. And Alcoholics Anonymous changed my life. Um, a little background, my mother's side of the family had a number of alcoholics. My great-grandfather was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. One of my uncles and aunts suffer from this disease. I have a cousin who is not in the rooms. So I truly believe now that um, that it is a genetic disease, and some people get it and some don't in families. Um, the reason I say that is that I grew up with a very different attitude towards any kind of substance abuse and alcoholism in particular than I have now. Um, the stories in my family were famous about how my great-grandfather um, came home drunk one night and my great-grandmother had gotten the town doctor to help her fake a suicide so that he would stop drinking and she would be able to pay the rent and take care of three small children. My grandfather routinely was arrested for being drunk and disorderly and my grandmother would tell the police, leave him there. So I grew up with the attitude that these people were morally lacking, and if they just tried harder, and if they just were good people and went to church, they wouldn't have these problems. I grew up with the attitude that alcoholism was bad, and that you were a bad person if you drank too much. Um, I was a good girl throughout school. I didn't, I, drugs are not a part of my story. I never even smoked pot, but when I turned 18, the legal drinking age at the time I turned 18, uh, was 18. When I turned 18, the legal drinking age was 18. And I can remember I had a, a boyfriend who was a freshman in college, and I was a, a, a senior in high school. And I remember going out and having a Tom Collins with him and thinking I was very, very grown up, that I, he had a car and I could have the Tom Collins. And, of course, I didn't have two because I was saving myself for college, and I didn't want him to have his way with me. Um, <laughs> And I was a good girl. All through my 20s, I would go either to a business, if I went to a business function, I didn't drink. And if I was out with friends, I'd have one or two drinks. Um, I never felt that I belonged. I'm dyslexic. I had a very hard time in school. I'm also an actress and a singer. I thought that made me different. Um, I have, as many people do, a difficult family situation. And so I grew up feeling not as good as everybody else. Convinced the girls didn't like me. Convinced the boys wouldn't want to talk to me. But something happened when I drank. All of a sudden, I was funny. All of a sudden, I could talk to everyone. All of a sudden, the boys wanted to be around me. And I liked that. I liked feeling that I was part of something. So through my 20s and 30s, alcohol became a solution. If I had a bad day, if I was uptight, if I didn't get the the acting job I wanted, having a couple of drinks would loosen me up and take care of whatever problems I might have. I moved to New York at the age of 40 with the idea that I was going to be a character actress and be a singer and, and, and make my living doing that here in New York, and that didn't happen. So I continued with my friend alcohol, and the funny thing was it started not working. It started not being fun. People started saying you know, I can't hire you if you're going to be drunk before the show and we're tired of taking care of you at the opening night party and this isn't cute anymore. Um, when 9-11 happened, the reason that I was not at my job near the World Trade Center was because I was at the dentist. Had I been down there, I could have been killed or hurt. That became an excuse to drink and I got a lot of sympathy. Any firefighter would give me whatever I wanted when I told that story. Um... So it, I went from enjoying having a drink and being funny and being told that I was funny at parties 
to needing a drink to get through the day. I never drank first thing in the morning, but I would have to drink at lunchtime. I'd have to drink right after work. I couldn't go to an audition or get up in front of a group of people and speak unless I'd had at least two or three beers. And what happened, I want to, to spend more time on recovery, so I'm going to make this very quick. Um, my bottom was um, the day after Christmas. I went out, thank you, and had a very bad blackout. I don't remember a lot of it, but I do remember that when I came to, my beloved dog was cowering in the corner and wouldn't come anywhere near me. And I thought, if a dog is afraid of me and afraid of my behavior, then there's something wrong here. I've got to do something about it. So I decided I would do controlled drinking for a week. I decided, okay, I'll, you know, maybe I have to do this AA thing. Maybe I really am a failure. So for the next week, until New Year's Eve, I went out and thought I'd have just one and had four or five. On New Year's Eve 2006, I got a bottle of champagne, was going to have one drink, and ended up drinking two bottles completely by myself. When I came to on New Year's Day 2006, I thought, this is it. You're like your grandfather, your great-grandfather. You're a bad person, and you're a failure. And I thought, I'm going to have to go to AA and tell these people what a failure I am. And I viewed my first AA meeting as going to jail, I walked in expecting people to make me sit in the corner or write a hundred times I'm a bad person and, and, and expecting no one to help me or want to talk to me. The opposite was true. When I said, I have two days, people said good for you and clapped. When women came up to me, they wanted to give me their phone numbers. They said, why? Well, we'd like to call you. Why? Why do you want to talk to me? Well, it just, we thought we could help you. And... I started gradually through this program to understand that alcoholism has nothing to do with your morals, your ethics, how you were raised, who your family is. It's a disease, and it's a killer disease. Um, I started working with a sponsor who was gave me a lot of tough love, and um, we started working on the steps, and gradually things started to change. I started to enjoy going to meetings as much as I enjoyed going to the bar and getting drunk. I started picking up the phone and calling people when I had a bad day or a problem instead of holding it in and thinking, all right, I'll deal with it later. I still do that, but I'm better at it. In sobriety, I went through some pretty serious medical problems. I'm now going through a lot of uncertainty in my job. And I have people I can call. I have a sponsor I can call up and say I'm scared. I have a grand sponsor who says to me, ask God for help, and I do. Mark talked about a, a higher power. And when I came into the program, I believed that there was a force greater than myself. I still thought I was running the show. And sometimes I still do think I'm running the show. But... Whenever I think something's a good idea, that's usually when a little light says, watch out. And I go to my higher power for guidance. I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. I have a wonderful sober family, a wonderful sponsor. I have people who have welcomed me as a part of their family. And no one has told me I'm a morally lacking person. Um... It makes me sad that my great-grandfather and grandfather and uncle and aunt and cousin and everyone else in my family isn't in a room like this, that they're out somewhere thinking that they're a failure because I've never met any alcoholic in this room who was anything but a miracle, and I mean that sincerely. Um, as Mark said, if you're counting days, you're going to get the opportunity to, to stand up and, and say your day count. And whether you have 90 days or one day, you're a miracle. Get up and say your day count. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. And um, I have a minute. I have a minute. All I, all, I can t <laughs> all I can tell you if you're new is get a sponsor. Do what they say, even though you may think they're full of it. They're not. They know more than you do. Um, read the big book. Help other people. And know that this is not the end of the world. This is the beginning of a new life. Thank you for loving me. 
and thank you for my sobriety. Board. Our main speaker tonight is Tom F. Well, I never knew drugs cleaned up this good. <laughs> I'm Tom F. Alcoholic. Now, I am not a problem drinker. Man, I hear some guys come in and talk. Oh, I picked up a drink. I was an instant alcoholic. I could cry. It's so sad. I had a good time drinking for a hell of a lot of years. This poor guy comes in. He is like getting pregnant without having sex. It's so messy. You know, it's sad. I had a good time. Alcohol has taken me to places that National Geographic's never seen. Yeah, that's the reason I drank. It was an answer. I had a problem. I'd go and have a few drinks, you know, and uh, my third uh, brain would kick in, the one I hadn't used for a while. It was rested, and uh, so we would figure out something to solve this problem. Like uh, probably the first thought was, let's have another drink. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. yeah. See, and then, uh, well, we won't have to act on this tomorrow. We postpone it until next week. That kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Tremendous system. It really worked. Uh, it really worked. Uh, I'm an alcoholic. I didn't mess with any other crap. The alcohol was enough for me. <laughs> uh, had I been younger, I probably would have messed with some other crap. But uh, I'm not younger, so I didn't. It's that simple. <laughs> See? Yeah. If you did, huh? I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Didn't work either. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's okay with me. Okay. Um, I get a real long drunk alone. That's a lot of crap. You all know how that goes. You know, it was it that, that I drank to feel good, just like you. And then I drank so I wouldn't feel so bad. Then I drank so I wouldn't feel nothing. <laughs> That's how I drank. <laughs> You know, that's why I did it. And we all did the same thing. You know, different places, different times, same thing. <laughs> so I'm going to get off of that drinking. You know, you can tell I'm not really wired normally. <laughs> but I won't bore you. Uh, I got the Alcoholics Anonymous as a result of some direct hits in my life. That's what brought me here. No inspiration or nothing of that type. Total desperation brought this drunk to Alcoholics Anonymous. I got here when all else failed. And it took me a lot of times, a lot of time in my life, to be to try all else. <laughs> and I got to say, failure, failure, failure. You know. You know, it's uh I'm the kind of a guy that would go out and 87 times go out to drink and get drunk 87 times and still believe the 88th time was going to be all right. <laughs> yeah, I would believe that. Huh? That's what's called delusional thinking. <laughs> That's what it is. Eh? It's not a long psychiatric term. You're goofy, Tom. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's how it was. It was I'm just goofy. My gooficity level was high. <laughs> As a result of your steps, it has been considerably lowered. <laughs> it's still alive. <laughs> and I best remember that. For I have a daily reprieve based on my distance from God. As I believe him. That's all I have. Hell, man, I still drive past the cemetery and feel like a no-show. <laughs> I'm not cocky about anything. I got a daily reprieve. It's no big deal. My God, my teeth get a daily reprieve, don't they? I'll price them. 
I think my soul should get more and more attention than my teeth. <laughs> I have just a gut level feeling that my soul has a longer shelf life than my teeth. <laughs> That's not too tough to figure. <laughs> you know, I'm not a doctor, but I sort of figured that. Okay. So I came to you guys, direct tits. I was married for 25 years to a, a very a nice girl who had no serious shortcomings except maybe poor judgment. <laughs> <laughs> and I come from an Irish Catholic background where, you know, Guys in my family, girls, they get married. Some better, some worse, some just break even, but they stay married, you know. In my case, it's not true. So, well, I got divorced. Had a lot of guilt for that. A lot of guilt. But because of a good sponsor and your eighth and ninth steps, I'm now free from that guilt. I don't know where the guilt went, and I'm not in pursuit of lost guilt. If you find it, keep it. I'm through with it. Me and my ex-wife became good friends. Actually, we became pen pals. Uh, she would send me a bill, and I would send her a check. <laughs> Look, you guys, it's been like that since Eve, and it ain't going to change by Thursday, so don't, nobody get excited. So that's about the way it is. That's a direct hit. You're divorced. Way bye byes. Everything was leaving now, see. I helped found the company with two older men. That was February 4th, 1950. The company was very successful. 29 years later, I got fired from that company. I didn't get a letter of reprimand in my personnel file. That's Kleenex material. Here, blow your nose, you snot nose. <laughs> You're fired, Tom. Maybe a a lot of companies can use a guy of your talent. Unfortunately, we are not one of those companies, and we need your keys at 2 o'clock to say, bye bye. Direct it. Right. They can't do that, Tom. You were stuck. Yes, they can. How do you know? They did. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Direct it. Well, I made a lot of money. On the way up, I, I didn't deal with individuals. I couldn't deal. I had that much of a heart. But I dealt with companies and corporations, and I was a shark. And damn, I was good at it. I kept my teeth sharp all the time. And I focused. I, I knew about singleness of purpose long before I met you. And I was one of nine kids. I was the oldest. And my father died when I was 18. And in those days, you know, you didn't go anywhere. You took care of your own. I didn't know any better. I'm no different than other guys at age group. You know, that's what you did. You know, that's what I did. What else you going to do? I ain't special. Huh? I'm good at it. I ain't special. <laughs> so that's what I did. Made a ton of money. Could have retired when I was 34. Good. Easy. But I got careless. I got arrogant. I stopped doing my homework. Man, I was on top of everything. Okay. And I start to lose a lot of money. So the best way I could tell it to you, on the way up, I was a shark. On the way down, I was beat. That's exactly what happened. I went stone broke. Stone broke. I went from living in a fashionable neighborhood to living under the last bridge you cross over before you go over into historic Fort McHenry. <laughs> That's where I was living. I lived under that bridge for one winter. I didn't live in a halfway house. I lived under a bridge where you learned, well, I like to call it bridge etiquette. <laughs> when you have choices, particularly pick a doubleheader bridge, double-decker, and railroad bridges are good for that. You always get close to the, the face of the bridge so that on wet days you stay dry. And on this double-decker uh, bridge, just sleep, sleep on the top shelf like you would in a bar picking booze, you know. The top shelf theory still holds uh, because even on dry days, there are other alcoholics who cohabit there who have careless plumbing problems. So it's but it's just a little, you know, bridge dwelling etiquette to be careful of, you know, when you pick your place to rest for the evening. Uh, it's sort of peaceful there if you're being harassed by bill collectors, you know. Uh, I'll give you a bulletin. Uh, U.S. does not deliver mail to bridge residents. 
<laughs> so there is a little respite, you know, from that type. It might be a, what would you call it, a, a amenity of location, something of that nature. That's what it was. So that's where I was living there. And I come to in a great big old room, big. And there's a big person standing like that, but it's double doors, but there's a glass, and the person's figure is silhouetted by the light behind. As the person approaches me sitting on a chair, this person, big, big, linebacker, big. It was a female person, real big, serious, big, big. I called her doctor, Mr. Nurse, really. And doctor, Mr. Nurse said to me, what's your problem, buster? Buster? Who the heck she thinks she's talking to? And I told Mr. Nurse I used to be a big shot. Uh, I was smart, too. I won an academic scholarship to John Hopkins University. And I did all this shit, too. And it's stuff anyway. And, <laughs> and Mr. Nurse said that she was impressed, but not a whole lot. And I went on to explain to her what my problem was. My problem was there was no knob on my side of this door. I thought it was an architectural oversight. And Mr. Nurse didn't see it that way. And she was bigger than me, and she had all the keys, and the subject did not seem to be open for discussion. And Mr. Nurse pronounced her finding and says, You are nuts. Now, she skipped the child within and got right to the point and told me, you are nuts. I felt somewhat relieved, for I had suspected this for quite a while. <laughs> you guys know and you girls know that's just outside stuff and it will heal rapidly. Sobriety alone will help that. How about... The inside stuff, the damage, that's a little slower to heal. How about guilt? Hmm? How about looking into the eyes of a person long after the arguments and shouting? Long after all that, all the pleading. And you just had broken your last sacred promise. And her eyes just missed it over. Nothing was said. And the roar of accusation was deafening. Not a word was said. But what I heard was, how could you? And I just murmured, I don't know. And how about the knife that's already plunged in my heart, just giving such a violent twist that I'm stunned in the silence and paralyzed into inaction? I'm so defenseless and without direction. I pray to a God I don't even believe in or trust. We don't pray. Men that desperate don't pray. We plead to him. And so did I. And I broke that promise too. And that's the measure of my shame. The promise I broke to those humans that love me is the measure of my guilt. And the promise I broke to an all-loving God is a measure of my shame. So in that condition, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was August 14th, 1980. I was divorced, fired, broke, nuts, crushed by guilt, shredded by shame, laying on the sidewalk of life, and I rolled off into the gutter. In that condition, I came here. I was willing to turn my will of my life over to Ronald McDonald. That's the kind of shape I'm in. I didn't come here to argue any philosophy or theology or psychology or any other ology. You know? I didn't know what to do. You know? Some guy says, oh, you got to find somebody you can relate to. Another old timer wanted to have some fun. He said, We got another guy came here three weeks out of the nut house. He's over there. You two nuts, what do you relate to him? Well, I intuitively knew that wasn't going to work. I had that much going. So I got me a, guess how I got a sponsor. The guy says to me, How are you? 
and you can feel a sponsor, your brain will not be able. He looked at me with his soft blue eyes. He wasn't looking through me judgmentally. We feel these things. Okay. And he didn't look past me to see who more important than me came into this room. He slowed his life down to my hopeless present and waited for an answer with politeness and dignity. Got 15 minutes? Yeah. That way, this way we all know where we're at. <laughs> okay, and I thank her. And so I asked her to be my sponsor. He said, I could use a nut like you. Now, how did he know I was nuts? I didn't give him my papers. I had the nut papers in my pocket. You know, you know what I mean? So I felt like, you know, people to have what I'm really called as registered dogs, a.k.a. dogs. I felt like a pedigree dog or something like I got nut papers in my pocket. You know? <laughs> well, anyway, he says, we're going to do the steps. I said, well, shouldn't I join an in-depth study group? Will we? And he says, no. Tom, there's nothing to study in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's things to do. If you want to study and polish up, we'll do that after you do them. That way we'll be talking about the same thing. Whoa. I said, uh-oh, this guy looks so gentle. I thought it was going to be a pushover. <laughs> Ooh, another bad judgment, Tom. This guy's going to be tough. He's going to cut you, or you won't know it for three days that you're bleeding. <laughs> He's one of those kind of guys. He says, are you an alcoholic? Oh, yeah, Wally, I'm an alcoholic. He was sober 16 years. I'm sober 16 minutes or something. He says, "Uh, you want to stop drinking? Oh, yeah, Wally, I want to stop drinking. He says, do you know how to do it by yourself? Oh, no, I just got out of a nut house trying to do it by myself. (laughs) He's okay. He says, are you willing to follow directions? Well, I didn't know what directions were, so I did what I do best. I lied. Oh, yeah, I'm willing to follow directions. <laughs> oh, what the heck am I supposed to say? I don't know. You know, it's the first time ever. It, I'm, when I come to AA, i have never been here before. You know, I just stayed. I, you know, I was here four months before I knew you could leave. <laughs> Nobody told me. <laughs> I thought I had a right to the president of AA or something like that and say I resign and he say we'll take you off the, you know. I, I, how do you, look, I got a goofy levels high. I told you that. Didn't you hear me? <laughs> I meant it. I wasn't kidding. Just because I say it funny. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I said, yeah, we'll do that. I'll follow direction. He says, good. good. When you pick up a drink, do you always know when you're going to stop? Oh, uh, no, Wally. I don't know. Resting officer knows, but I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he says, didn't you tell me you stopped a lot of times? Yeah, Wally, I did, but I started again. He says, do you always know when you're going to start? No, Wally. He says, so it seems to me that when you pick up a drink, you're powerless because you don't know when you're going to stop And it seems to me that when you're stopped and you're not drinking, you're powerless over when you're going to start. So it don't make any difference. When you stopped or started, you are in a powerless condition. That's what it's all about. I thought, wow, what a wise man. And then I read page 43 in the big book. (laughs) The dilemma was uh, powerlessness. And that's what this book's about. Finding the power, which will solve the problem. Don't say it will make me smart enough to solve it. A powerless will solve the problem. And when God, I call God because for three reasons, my sponsor does, uh, it's easy to remember and it's not hard to spell. So I, I'd say God. You know, it just makes sense to me. And he'll do the job. After God's done the job, there's nothing for you to do. But thank God and go help others and tell them who did what for you. Well, I ain't quali- you never will be qualified, but God is. 
Okay, Wally, don't get tacky. I'm doing you. Now he says, uh, you got to, you want to turn your will and your life over to care of God. You know, just ask God to direct you. That's all. What should I do today? I say a prayer every morning. You know? Good morning, God. This is Tom. I know you know who I am, but a lot of times I forget who I am. What do you want me to do today? I'd appreciate it if you make it sort of plain. I'm alcoholic, you know. <laughs> P.S. Give me the gumption to get it done. I'm also wayward. <laughs> That's as bad a plain as I can get. And is it truthful? See? God is always the same. Go help my other kids. And I will say, I'm not going to get over there. And I go. I go. Just in God's hands. You can't live. How much time I got? Ten minutes. I cannot get this in. You got to know this. I got to move this from this spiritual realm we're in right now right to the street. I had to find out. Can you take these principles in Alcoholics Anonymous and apply them to your everyday affairs in the world? And my answer, I wasn't sure. My answer today, I'm 100% sure, and it's yes. That company hired me back to fire me because it went to a couple other guys that, uh, anyway, they did. And I didn't want to make money the way they were making money, so I quit this time. I was 57 years old, and I quit. Most guys are looking for a rocket chair, and I'm looking for a rocket ship. <laughs> I started a brand new company. Guess what principles I used to found this company? The 12 Traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is a for-profit company. We don't take no secret or gifts for, for, for nobody. And I founded that company in uh, 1987. How many years? That's almost 20 years, isn't it? It'll be 20 years soon. Peggy says 20 years, and she's sort of bossy. So she's probably right. <laughs> I wanted to keep the company small because I wanted to keep spiritual principles in first place. So I, I, I tried everything to keep it small, everything. Right now, we're doing business all over the United States. I got four guys with average recovery time of 15 working with me. Jim knows me. He's very successful, extremely successful. We make more money than we spend. <laughs> And our advertising budget since for 20 years is still under $1. We haven't spent a single dollar. We do work for banks in California. We're licensed in Maryland, Delaware, uh, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And I only got those licenses. I didn't want to expand the country, but I had these men that came to me. So did. God lets me have this toy to put gas in the damn car. I know that. Yeah. And he's amused with me. Because once in a while, God likes the way I pray. Yeah. And you guys taught me how to pray. Hey, look, I studied theology four years in a Roman Catholic seminary. Don't tell me I ain't no searcher. <laughs> when I start to pray, God goes, Phew. Recess. <laughs> he knows it's going to be fun and it ain't going to last long. <laughs> That's how to pray. It comes from the heart. It's okay. You're, it's okay to pray that way. I thought I could, I could impress God. Wally says, what do you mean? Do you think you could impress the power or whatever you call them that made the Rocky Mountains? You ever see them big mountains? I looked at him and looked, that's a no way I can impress him. I went down and put my hand on the little steggy lights down there. It was about 200 feet high. Put my hand on that sucker. Looked up at that deep blue sky. I says, Tom, are you big enough to offend the power that made this big rocky thing here that you don't know the right name for? <laughs> I looked at puny me and that big sky. 
in beautiful color. It's a new way. New way. You're not good enough to get to this guy. So one day I was coming into Chicago, and that was Jim and I were talking about it. It was December 23rd. It just snowed. It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the planes were stacked up going, you know. I look down there, and you see all the highways coming into Chicago and the railways. It's like a half a circle because the lake cuts it off there. And the planes are circling around, you know. Nothing else to do. I'm looking out the window, and uh, I got five minutes. We're good. We're, we're good. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm looking out the window after circling around about five or six times. I'm looking all these ways you can get to Chicago. And man, it hit me. God's got to be bigger in Chicago. Look at all the ways you can get to Chicago. There's got to be more ways than that even to get to God. I just thank you, God, for making it clear. <laughs> so he says, pass it on. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not saying you got to do it that way. I'm saying that's what I did. That's all. That's my experience, and I'm to share that. What you do with it's your business. I mind my own business. And the older I get, the less business I got. <laughs> so, I don't have much business to mind. You know what I mean? I don't have much business at all. And let me share this little story with you, and then I can shut up. There were some people here from Philadelphia, friends. My sister, <laughs> she's been a nun about 40 years. And she's been a street nun. She worked on the street a lot. She's a brilliant woman. She taught at McGill University and all that stuff. You don't hear that shit. Anyway, she don't either. So what the hell? You? I'm going to see her Thursday. We meet the nun and the drunk once a year, and we discuss the spiritual changes in our life. I'm going to meet Thursday. We've been doing that. One year, she had me come to Paris. And she had me talk to the whole bunch of nuns. You imagine that a drunk like me? Button papers? <laughs> anyway, there was a Spanish nun, Malegra. Spoke no English and started to pray for Sister Sheila's brother, the drunk. She didn't know my name, but she knew what I was. Let me describe properly. <laughs> she prayed for me for nine years, and after nine years of her prayer, I was sober for a year, and I went to Philadelphia to thank her, and she was 199, right? And sitting in a, a chair with a little uh, blanket with Afghans. Maybe that's a bad word now, political. It's not, okay. Uh, <laughs> but she had a little young nun bilingual. So I went to thank her. And I said, I told the young nun, I came to thank Sister Malaker for her. And they start talking. And the nun start crying. I said, oh, what have I done now? You know, we are. So I told her, I, she, she said, Sister Malegra says that you are not to thank her. She used to thank you. For all these years here recently, all the nuns she has been with all over the world, Malegra believes have gone home to God, their father. And up until today, today, Malegra has believed for some time that God simply forgot where she was. Now, Malegra says, she's reassured that not only does God know where she is, but he still hears her prayers for Sister Sheila's brother, the drunk, is sober through the grace of God, Alcoholics Anonymous. And the prayers of people who we don't even know are praying for us. So be careful. How we thank people. Do not exclude people. You know, it's that simple. So, I'm not going to stretch. I'm out of time. And I thank you. And I love you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.